identity. It's about an attack for which there's no known motive. It may have been a robbery which went wrong. Conceivably, the assailants may have intended to cause harm. Either way, it finished up as murder. Our reconstruction begins in September near East Ham in the capital. This is part of London's East End, where for centuries migrants have settled, the latest being largely Bengalis, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. Atek Hussein came here in 1978 and went straight into the restaurant trade. He married Panna 12 years ago, and they and their children got a maisonette in East Ham off Newham Way. Atek was devoutly religious and devoted to his family. His other interest was his restaurant, an hour or more's journey from his home. The food is very short, short Monday. He owned it jointly with his brother, Malik. My brother and I started restaurant business many years ago. We bought a Wallingham Tandoori eight, nine years ago. Uh, what about the shopping list? Have you shopping, got that? Um, get some green chili and kulfi. Atmosphere at the restaurant are all friendly. Some of them call Atek, you know, Chacha mean uncle. Some of them call him a bai, bai mean brother. <laughs> I don't know. It's been a very long time. You've been on holiday. You have just come back. You've got a nice tan coming up. <laughs> Let me get your menu for you. Have you brushed your teeth? Yes. And you washed your face? Yes. Okay. In we go. Snuggle up. Okay. Good night. Good Don't night. stay up talking now. Good night, night, Mom. I'm going, okay? Good night. Good night, Mark. Bye. Are you two finished? Yeah. Yeah. All right, then. I'll just get changed, and then we can go. After dropping off the two employees, Attic arrived home in Bernal's Avenue at about 2.30 a.m. be your father. He's got his keys. He wouldn't be ringing. Go out the door. Something's not right, Dolly. Phone the police. When I turned into Burnells Avenue, by the phone box where the first emergency call was made, I saw a pool of blood on the pavement. I then went to the house where the second call had been made, and the door was closed. I attempted to open the door, but it was it, there was something behind it stopping me opening it, and it was then that I heard groaning and moaning from behind the door. A local resident noticed other people at the scene apart from the police.
across the confirmed an ambulance has been called to Burnells Avenue E6 over. Excuse me, I don't know if it's got anything to do with what's going on here, but I've just seen a bloke hanging around on that corner. What, this side? Yeah, stay here, mate. Paramedics were there within five minutes of being called, but no one could have saved him. Atek had been stabbed through the heart. Just ask, as I said at the beginning, Atek had no known enemies, did he? No, that's right. He was a much loved family man. Now, you've got a description of one of the guys who were running away. Two of them, and they were both Asian, you think. What else do you know about this chap? Yes, that's right. Uh, a witness saw two Asian men running away. Uh, we have a good photo fit uh, of one of them. What else do you know about him? He's uh, in his 20s. Anything more in description? Well, as you can see, he's uh, medium height, medium build, with thick black hair with a side parting. And uh, we believe he was wearing a dark bomber-style jacket. The white car that was seen at the end of the road, is that, do you think, significant? Or, or are you looking for witnesses there? Are you looking to eliminate that? Yes, we certainly want to speak to the occupants of that car because uh, we believe it could be holding witnesses. It's a long time ago, this, September the 18th of, uh, sep Sunday 18th of September. Uh, people will have thought of that as a Saturday night, of course, late on a Saturday night four months ago. There was also th the man who was seen on the corner there. Again, he's probably a witness, nothing to do with the, the attack. We need to trace him, though. Yes, that's right, but uh, unfortunately I haven't got a very good description other than uh, he was black, about five foot eight. But uh, again, we'll be treating him as, uh, at this stage as a witness. Now this uh, jack ordinary man's denim jacket with a very distinctive uh, logo which is Portland College on the breast pocket and it's got uh, this green lapel or collar in corduroy. Tell us how that was discovered and why yes. it's significant. That was found about a quarter of a mile away from the scene uh, in some uh, rough ground. Uh, we believed it was done on the night because uh, the undergrowth was all wet and uh, that was dry. So we'd like to speak to anybody who knows this jacket, has seen this jacket, or uh, seen anybody who uh, owned this jacket and uh, hasn't been seen wearing it since the date of the incident. Which is the 18th of September. There's a £5,000 reward which has been put up by the Community Action Trust, so please call us if you can. It's quite likely that people in the Asian community who want to help have been unable to because of language barriers. So because of that, a select of speakers here to take calls this evening. If you can help, please ring the studio, 0500 600 600, or you can contact the incident room at Stratford in East London, where they speak five languages, incidentally, as well as English. That's 0171 275 5411. Notice we're now using the new dialing codes with an extra one in the number, 0171 275 5411. Miss Stevens. It happened three months ago, and detectives had hoped the inquiry, like most murder investigations, would have been completed quickly. But the attack on Shona still has too many elements of mystery, and hence, tonight, this nationwide appeal. The events took place in Ayrshire last November. Shona Stevens was a single parent. She'd been divorced when her daughter Candice was a baby and came home from abroad to live at her mother's house in Irvine. It's Candice showing me the new book she got home from school. Mm, she wanted me to read it straight away. I said we'd wait till bedtime. Just a minute. Shona and Candice returned to this country from South Africa in 1988. Her uh, marriage broke up at that time. That's drugs, is it? I got bored of smoking letters. Shona and Candice got on very well together. Just one. She cared a lot about Candice. Shona was a quiet, reserved girl and a private girl. We moved to South Africa when Shona was about two years old, and she went to school there, from junior school to secondary school. She was um, top of her class always. She attained her um, school colors, her academic colors. 
Which was quite an achievement. If I saw things from Richard's point of view, I'd be so afraid of accidents that I'd never leave my room, Anne Taylor muttered. This is Bawtree Hill Park in Irving, the route between Shona's home and the shops. Shona walked through here several times a day, and in late October, a woman who works in the precinct remembers seeing Shona with a man, a man police now need to trace. I stepped out just to have a cigarette, and I saw Shona walking past. She got to the steps, and then all of a sudden, this chap was almost at her heels. He said a few words to her, and then the next thing he said, see you. And Shona carried on up to the top of the steps. Shona had quite a small group of friends, and she was never the type to stop and talk just to anyone on the street, you know, any passerby. What do you think of this? Not sure of the pattern. Mm. I'm going to the shops. Do you want anything? No, I don't think so. Won't be long. Thursday, the 10th of November, shortly before one o'clock. As usual, Shona made her way through Bawtree Hill Park towards the precinct. Eighty-two pence, please. Thank you. Eighteen pence, thank you. A few shots away was Doug McConaughey. Well, it was shortly after one when I left the house. I went into the bookies to put a wheel line on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Right, would you like an early price? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's better today. It is. It was freezing yesterday. It's lovely today. Right. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. You. Shona then went back through Bawdry Hill Park. down the hill and I seen the dog coming up and the man behind it and I just keep watching the dog because it was in the loose you know and the dog was about 12 or 14 feet in front of him and when the dog passed I got a glimpse of the man and he says hi and I says hi and carried on. This is a potentially important witness who's never been traced. A few minutes later I was walking along I seen a girl lying in the woods Look, can you ring for the police and an ambulance? I've just come through the wood and there's a woman lying there and she's very badly hurt. Shona was unconscious and had been so severely beaten that an air ambulance was called in from Prestwick Airport. Shona never regained consciousness. She died three days later at Glasgow's Southern General Hospital. Pablo, you've made an uh, enormous number of inquiries locally. It's now three months removed from the murder. How can people help at this stage? We've still got lots of people who are in the park who haven't yet come forward. We're still turning these people up. It's important that everyone who was in the park that day comes forward and speaks to us and gives us the opportunity to interview them. Even if they don't think they saw anything important? Even if they didn't think in their mind they saw anything important, it's important that we get the opportunity to assess that. Now, there were some people in that reconstruction that plainly are, are key people you need to talk about. The man who spoke to her a couple of weeks beforehand, yes, before this happened. Have you got any other description of this man? The man was in his 30s. He was 5 foot 8 in height. He was medium build, short dark hair, dressed casually. Obviously, he knew Shona. We haven't traced him yet. He may know other people with whom Shona was uh, acquainted, and we need to trace everyone who knew her. OK, other people in the park. We saw the guy with the dog, a doberman, I think it was. There were other people who weren't shown in that reconstruction. There was a chap with a bike at one stage that you, you needed to trace. Yes, there was. The man was seen entering the park from another direction, going towards where Shona was attacked about five to seven minutes after one o'clock. He is a potentially vital witness. He may have seen Shona and anyone else who was there at that time. And a man seen emerging from the park via some bushes at the far end of the park. Yes, there was a man, again, he's 35 to 40 years of age, medium build, five foot nine. He had fair hair which was gelled and he was coming from the direction again where Shona was attacked and it's very important to do you think the, the, the key to this lies in the local community but but just let's make this clear these are witnesses you're looking for they are not suspects yes 
we want to get information from anyone who is in that park. We need to speak to everyone who is there, and these people are vital witnesses to us. The community really must help us and come forward and tell us everything they know about that morning in that park. This man is plainly very dangerous. Please, if you can help, call us here 0500 600 600. If you recognise yourself as one of those potential witnesses featured in the reconstruction, or if you were simply in Bawtree Hill Park on Thursday the 10th of November, please call us here in the studio. Or you can ring the instant room in Kilmarnock, that's 01 563 572 217. That's 01 563, the code for Kilmarnock, 572 217. It takes us back two months to a cold Wednesday in mid-January, and it takes us to a suburb of Cardiff, St. Mellons. Claire Hood, a 15-year-old, was murdered while truanting from school. The whole community is anxious that her killer has still escaped detection and hope that in the next few minutes somebody will recall sightings or reawaken suspicions about someone who'd acted oddly at the time. The story starts and ends in Cath Cobb Woods. <laughs> Did you see him? Madam. Oh, There's a guy that. over there with a hood on. Where? Yeah. Over here. Yeah, oh, oh, she's on, too late, go. he's gone now. Claire and her friends often played in Cathcob Woods. In fact, the woods are quite close to her home. Her parents were separated, so Claire and her younger sister lived with their mother. Claire was in her fourth year at Romney High. Come back, I must tell you. Out of bed, Claire. All right. And it's a cold water treatment. She was a great kid. She, not just a daughter, a friend. She shared my clothes with me. I share the problems that she had with me with her. Sometimes I have to play the mother. Claire, I can't believe you're not at school yet. No, I know I'm going. Oh, you can laugh. <laughs> but I'm the one that has to answer to the teachers. I know a pool competition for my trophy next week. From the juice club? Yeah. So they've engraved my name on it. I can't wait. Great. Looks at me. I know. Now, off to school. Okay, then. You're back by about seven, usual time, right? Yeah. Okay. Bye. Hiya. Hiya. Uh, turn around, please. Come on, I'm going to be late. Good morning, madam. Ta. Go light. Yeah. Oh, does me tell me? No, I can't. Why? No, I'm just bored. Claire, go ask for the grass, please. Nurse, my last friend. Okay. This is the last definite sighting of Claire. Where did she go next? Meadow. Meadow. When I turned round, this man suddenly appeared in front of me on the path. He was aged about 25 to 28 years old. He was about 5 foot 6, 5 foot 10. He wore dark clothes. His jacket had a hood, but it wasn't on his head at the time. It's now 3.20. Was this Claire, or could it have been you? Good 
deep here, almost. You don't need that, just breathe in. He obviously was in a great hurry. I would describe him as five foot six to five foot eight inches tall, slight build, and dark complexion. The man seemed to come from the woods. Awful thoughts were going through my mind as it was after Claire's character not to be there. I always knew where Claire was going and she was never late from school anyway. Elaine? Yeah, um... Claire, uh, she's, uh, she's not under your place, is she? No. She's not back, you see, and, um, well, I was just, um, I was just getting a little bit worried, because, you know, she, she never does things like this, no. Well, did you see her leave school, or? No, I, I, I gotta go. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna try and ring Kelly. I, I've rung around all her friends, and nobody... Nobody seems to have seen her, you see, and I, yes, I'll do, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll ring the police right now. Called the police. I then began a search with some friends around the area of St. Melons. I felt I had to do something myself. And we ended up in Cathcart Woods. A last resort, really. Anything over there? No. no. Come on, it was freezing that night. Claire's body was discovered in the morning. She'd been sexually assaulted. You've had overwhelming help from the local community, Colin Jones, but you still want to get to new witnesses. Now, tell me who. You were telling me just before we came on air, people in Cathcart Woods, even though they didn't know Claire had nothing to do with this, you still want everybody who's been in the woods to talk to you. Why? That's right. Well, we're working on the theory that the person responsible for this had an intimate knowledge of the woods, and therefore these people may have seen the culprit in the woods on the previous occasion. Even though they had no idea of that, you still want everybody to come forward? Yes, everyone that uses those woods, please could they come forward, whether it was on the 18th or prior to the 18th of January this year. What about friends of Claire? Well, there's been a general reluctance on, by some of the friends of Claire to tell us all that they know in relation to uh, the Cathcart Woods or indeed the habits of Claire. Uh, I think there's a variety of reasons for this. It's all I can assure them, they have my personal assurance that they will not get into any trouble. And I ask them to impart in us any information that they're withholding. So if they've been truanting from school or underage smoking or anything else, you're not interested... I mean, this is a murder inquiry. You're not interested in that. That is correct. Will you protect them from, from that? Yes, I shall. They have my personal assurance. OK. You have actually got some other sightings of, of youngsters in the woods at the, at the time. Just tell us about that. Yes, we have a sighting at 3.20 of a girl standing on a bridge. And uh, to that end, uh, we're appealing for anyone to come forward. Also, there's a motorist who saw three children, school children, we ran across the Willowbrook Drive towards the general direction of the woods. Two boys and a girl. It's possible that the girl was Claire. But if not, or even if it was, you desperately need them to come forward? We desperately need them to come forward, OK, yes. this is Wednesday, the 18th of January. Now, there was a man also, uh, apart from the one that we've seen, it's somebody else seen coming out of the woods. Yes, at uh, 25 past three, a man was seen running from the general direction of the woods across Willowbrook Drive towards Brookfield Drive. He's described as being six foot tall, slim build, fair complexion, fair hair, and had some distinctive clothing. He had this, uh, or at least this is a replica, 
the fairly distinctive yes. hat he's wearing. We should stress, he's not a suspect. You want him to come forward to eliminate himself? Yes, we would like this person to come forward to eliminate himself. Okay. Mm -hmm. If there's any way that you can help, please do, particularly if you're a youngster, you haven't come forward up to now because you're worried you might get into trouble over something. I mean, don't worry about that. Call us, please. 0500 600 600. It's a free call here to the studio in London. If you prefer, you can dial the Romney Police Station in Cardiff. That's on 0122 277 4285. That's 0122 277 4285. A great grandmother and a popular figure in the little village where she lived, Burton Fleming in East Yorkshire. On Thursday, February the 9th, in the middle of the afternoon, someone for no reason anyone can think of, ran after her down a country road and killed her. Two people witnessed the whole thing. The Wilson family have farmed at Eastfield for three generations, and till last month, Margaret, together with her husband, still helped out their son. Is here all right? You get your stuff inside, Mum. I'll shift it later. The son, Alan, took over this farmhouse 12 years ago, and his parents moved down to the village. But this home remained the focus for all the family, including Margaret's daughter, Heather. Oh, hello, Bob. Hi, Bob. Look, I've got to go. I've just dropped some stuff off for Dad. I'll be late for work. Um, I'll see you on Thursday, though, about 2 o'clock. Oh, lovely. And drive carefully. She's a very homely person. Her life revolved around the family. She loved the children, and now the grandchildren, any children, she just absolutely loved. She loved the countryside. She had to go for a walk every day to get some fresh air. She thought fresh air um, was the cure for everything. Thursday the 9th of February. This is Burton Fleming, a mile from the family home. It was very cold on the Wednesday night. We'd had a little bit of snow. I noticed a white car coming up the road. I saw the car four times, what I'd call crawling up and down, really slowly. I wondered what it was up to. It was a white Montego estate with black roof rails and with black plastic trim along the side. Just round the corner is the house that Margaret and her husband had moved to. Just in time, I made this pie for young Mark. Oh, Mum, you shouldn't have. Mind you, he'll love it. Thanks. When I visited, I would very often go home with some sort of home cook, something or other. She was just very thoughtful. Oh, uh, no more for me, thanks, Mum. Really, I must be going. OK, love, I I'll come with you if you don't mind. I, I need some fresh air. Just drop me off down the road. That afternoon, two tractor drivers were working close to the Wilson's farm. Hey, Martin, what do you want to do at this headland? Do you want to go up it? Uh, I don't know. I think uh, if we go back to the other end, we tell we get back to this corner, it'll be about far o'clock. It'll be time for me to go home. Meanwhile, back in the village, Just take me down to Eastfield. That'll give me 20 minutes' walk. Fine, OK. I heard a car slowing, so I stopped. It's a way of a staring. It was frightening. Very frightening. I wanted to run.
Now you've seen that bloke over there, looks like you're running after Mrs. Wilson. Bloody hell, he jumped her. time we'd got sort of halfway across the field the man was just about run back to his car so as we reached the road he was in his car and driving off Martin over here there's been somebody attacked down by the road can you get an ambulance you know what What's happened? Have you got a telephone? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I just got hold of her hand, her arm, and you could tell there was nothing there. It was something that I couldn't really believe, even though I was there, holding her hand. But somehow it wasn't my mother. I just couldn't believe it. Tony Coggan, this is an, an appalling crime, and I know it's one that you fear could be repeated in time. You've actually, apart from the car, which we'll come to in a moment, you've not got an awful lot on the man, have you? Well, one would think so initially, but actually when we look at the few clues we have, we can in fact eliminate a good percentage of the population. Now the man we're looking for, he's described as six foot tall. He's described as about 30 years of age. He's got brown hair, collar length, and it's flicked up at the edges. He also he ran 350 yards to kill Mrs. Wilson, and then he sprinted 350 yards back to his car. Now to do that, he must have a reasonable degree of fitness. We don't say he's fat or thin, but he was certainly fit. Now the type of man who might do this, he could come from anywhere in the country. The, the description is vague, but it eliminates a lot of people. Now, we've got a, a video fit of him. One of the witnesses came down to London. Mm. This is the first time any picture of him has been shown. I don't know how confident mm. you are of this, because obviously the, the witness at the time didn't realise anything about the seriousness of what might follow. Yes, it's only a description. It's an artist's impression. But I wouldn't want anyone to sit at home thinking they know who the killer is, but not telephones, because he simply doesn't fit all the exact description of the, our offender on the profile. Now, one of the things that you know, or pretty sure about the offender, is that he felt very comfortable using knives. The, the style of killing Mrs. Wilson indicated the killer was very, very comfortable holding a knife. Now, when we look at that, we think, well, is he a serviceman? Has he worked in the industry whereby he's been killing animals? We're very reluctant, for very obvious reasons, to uh, show murder weapons on this programme. Um, it's, it's ghoulish, apart from anything else, but the detectives are very, very anxious that we show you this. Now, why are you so keen that viewers should, should see this knife? Well, first of all, the knife, which has a four-inch blade and is made by Adams, a Sheffield company, the, the blade itself is actually discoloured. It's blackening across the blade. Mm -hmm. We have failed to establish what caused that. It's some continual cutting created, but we haven't determined what it is. So I'd ask, ask the viewers, first of all, do you recognise a knife? Uh, is one missing? And importantly, what has a knife been used for? Now, this car that's the best clue you've got. Yeah. And we should point out, you don't want people to ring and say, oh, well, I happen to know somebody's got a white Montego estate with these black bits of trim and black uh, rails on the top, because there are tens of thousands of them. You know them all. Yeah, qu qu quite, tens of thousands. But if we can connect the Montego car, a state car, a similar car, with the knife, with the description of our offender, we will eliminate a lot more people and get closer to the suspect. OK. Now, there is, a, in addition to this white Montego, another car. This one is not a suspect at all. It's a possible witness. Tell us about it, can you? A most important witness. It's a red GTI-type car with a spoiler. Travelled past the scene towards Burton Fleming just prior to Mrs Wilson being murdered. That driver may unwittingly have invaluable information for us, and I'd ask him or her to contact us immediately. OK. This is at 3.30 p.m. Thursday, February the 9th, it's exactly five weeks ago Five weeks today. ago, yes. So if that could have been you, please call. If there's any way that you can help at all, please call. And that's uh, 0500 600 600. It's a free call. 
0500 600 600. Many of the detectives on the case are actually here in the studio, but their colleagues are in the incident room, and you can call that too. It's on 0148 285 6556. That's 0148 285 6556. Lee Finley in Liverpool. Although eight months have passed now since she was killed, detectives believe there are still people who may have important information on the case. In fact, it wasn't until three months after Julie's death that the most important witness in the case so far came forward. And that's when our film begins in Liverpool, where Julie lived. What time do you have to Mum and Dad's lunch, Lindsay? Probably about one. Do you want a lift? That'd be great. You could pick us up around quarter to. Just hang on a minute. I want to go and get a paper. Do you remember I told you about that girl who ran in front of a car outside the hospital? I was badly shaken because I nearly knocked her down. Yeah, so? Well, that's it. That's the girl. Well, maybe you should ring in and tell somebody about it. Come on. Incident room, Farmworth Street. Can I help you? Yes. So you recognise her from the poster, do you? And when exactly did this happen? Definitely that Friday, was it? Right, yeah. Can you remember anything else about her at all? Yeah. Julie Finley was 23. She'd lived all her life in Liverpool, growing up in a close family of five children. Julie's my second oldest child. As a child, she was very lovable, very kind, soft hearted. Julie started changing when she was about 19. My first notice when her personality started changing. I got told that Julie was on drugs, which shocked me, really shocked me. I was very upset and very disappointed in Julie, because I thought, you know, Julie was more sensible than that. She used to touch drugs. Although Julie's addiction to heroin had dramatically changed her life, she'd remained close to her family. Oh, yeah, finally bringing me stuff back. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't order. We're not following them anymore. Is me mum in? Yeah. Mum, it's our Julie! Hello, Hello Jill. How are you doing, love? I'm all right, I'm a bit tired. A bit run down, you know. How are you? Yeah, same as usual, nothing new. You've just missed your dad, he's gone out for the afternoon. Yeah, too when he gets back in. Yeah. Mum, can I have a bath? Too? Yeah, go up. There's still some hot water left. Feeling better? Mm hmm. You're taking care of yourself? Mm, trying to. Mum, can I borrow three pounds? Sure. Pass me by. I'll give it back when I get my chair. Okay? Oh, don't worry about it. There you go. Nice. Oh, shall I come out on Sunday lunch? Yeah, that'd be nice. Listen, if I get off, all right, but I'll see you on Sunday. Yeah. Look after yourself. Okay. Julie and her boyfriend had recently moved into a friend's flat near Faulkner Square. So how was your mum's then? Fine. She wants me to go around for Sunday lunch. Oh, you gonna go? Yeah, probably. You going out soon then? Yeah, I better get going really. What time do you think you'll be back? Oh, a couple of hours. All right, see you later then. See ya. The neighbourhood is a well-known red light area, and Julie mixed frequently with the local prostitutes. That night, a prostitute who knew Julie saw her in Grove Street. Julie mentioned she was expecting to meet someone at 11.
It was shortly after 11, and not far from here, that the witness who saw the poster was driving home along Pembroke Place. Julie seemed to be running towards someone across the road. This man would have been one of the last people to see Julie alive. The next day, 15 miles outside Liverpool. The uh, Liverpool Century Road Club were having a 10 mile time trial race on the Rainford Bypass. Oh, Kevin, I'm on there. Not too bad. Yeah. I'd gone along to collect my number and my start time. Um, after I collected that, I wanted to answer the call of nature before I set off. So I uh, headed to some bushes uh, by a field at the side of the lay-by. Mike, here, quick! I think I found a dead body in it. We better have a look. Julie had been strangled. And, you know, it was just art. This mother says that there was not, no card, nothing from it. I just went up to a grave. The flowers I got from Mother's Day, I put them on Julie's. You know, because I miss her so much and I loved her. Well, Mr. Yule, you have one witness who saw something which could be very important. It was on the night Julie died and at the lay-by where her body was found at around the time she was died. She died as well. That's correct, yes. At about 12.45am on the morning that Julie's body was to be found or later, a white transit van with a D, E or F registration was seen in the lay-by, which is near the Wee Chief public house on the Rainford Bypass. Um, there could be one of three reasons this vehicle was there. Either it was used and the girl was killed in the back of it. Secondly, her body could have been transported to the scene in that vehicle. Or thirdly, it may be that it's quite an innocent reason it's there, namely a courting couple who've been reticent to come forward because perhaps they were embarrassed. If that latter is the case, please, discretion will be the watchword with me. If they come forward, let us eliminate this. It's most important that we find this family. Right, so please do call if that was you. The last definite sighting of Julie herself is still back in Liverpool in Pembroke Place near her flat. Yes, that's right. As you've seen from the film, that uh, a man was seen to be uh, approached by Julie who was obviously anxious to speak to him. He may well be her drug stealer. Uh, the man's description, about 28 years, 5 foot 10 to 6 foot, stocky build, dark, tidy hair and dressed in dark clothing. Now... I'm not interested in the drugs aspect. I'm interested in finding the killer. And so I would ask anybody who can suggest who this man may be uh, or who was in the area at the time to come forward again in complete confidence. Right. Now, some of Julie's clothes are still missing. That's absolutely right. And if I can show Where clothes they? that we've purchased. These are a white blouse and brown buttons at the top and black jeans. They're in good condition. They were found by a young man the following day uh, on the wasteland at Low Hill. Um, the young man didn't read anything into this and left them, but he didn't contact the police for several days. And when we arrived, and happily, the clothes had disappeared. We do believe firmly that they were Julie's. We feel whoever's taken them has committed no crime, but found that they're in good condition, could utilize them. So I say to them, it's absolutely essential we find those clothes for forensic examination. They're in no trouble. Come forward. Please let me have them. Absolutely vital. If you can help, please do call. Your information and your identity will be treated with great discretion. Detectives and BBC staff are here answering calls in the studio, 0500 600 600. Or you can ring Mr Yule's colleagues at the incident room in Liverpool on 0151 777 3600. That's 0151 for Liverpool, 777-3600. Aftermath of a crime that last month became a major news item. Hi, hello, is Roxanne there, please? Yeah, um, Roxanne? Yeah. Hello, can we come in, please? Yeah, yeah certainly, thank you. Do you want to sit down? I've got some very sad news. It's about your mother. Janet Brown lived in the village of Radnidge in Buckinghamshire.
Her murder achieved huge publicity because, to put it bluntly, she was attractive, she was affluent, and she was found naked in her home. In fact, there's no evidence of a sexual element to the crime. It seems she may have woken to find an intruder. Her husband works in Switzerland, and of their three children, only the youngest, Roxanne, still lived at home. So they were trying to sell the house. She was a wonderful mum. She was very kind and caring, very good listener. She always understood me very well and never bossed me around. And I miss her so much. She was a great friend as well as a mum. Hello. Hi, it's me. Oh, hi. How are you doing? Fine. Any more news from our house back? I mean, he's still keen. You know, I'm still hoping to get back at the weekend. Depends how things go here, of course. She was a super person. She was warm and friendly. She was very loyal to her family. Uh, she was. She looked after the kids very well. Um, and uh, as well as that, she was quite a determined person, quite a, a plucky person. Early morning call. Thanks. Oh, darling. Mm? You know, the builders are coming today. And since you're on holiday... What are they doing? They're going to fix the barn roof. Oh. So can you make sure they're OK? I shall leave a key out in case they need to get in. In the kitchen? Ah. What are you doing today? I've got a driving lesson this morning. Oh. I can't believe you passed first time. You told me you are going to fail. Do you fancy coming out? I'd love to. You can stay over if you like. Okay, I'll tell my mum I won't be back tonight. Right, my driving instructor's here. See you later. Everything okay? Yeah, no problem. Janet's initial training was as a nurse and a midwife. And then, after many years off looking after the kids, she had recently returned to work, and her current project was to, to examine the possibility of there being a link between infertility treatment and the ultimate development of cancer in women. No one remembers Janet leaving work that day, but she'd normally have gone home at roughly half past five. I'd been out riding for about an hour and was heading home on Spriggs Holly Lane when I noticed Janet heading towards me, heading away from her house and towards Radnich. She appeared to be preoccupied with something. Normally she'd slow down as I was on a horse, but on this occasion she didn't. I don't remember that she was in her own car. Can I just use your phone? You just want to give Mum a quick ring at home? Yeah, sure. Thanks. How are you? I'm feeling really tired. I think I'm going to go to bed early. What time are you coming back tomorrow? Um, lunchtime, probably. Oh, OK. I'll leave the alarm on. OK. See you. Bye. Bye. We know Janet also took a call from one of Roxanne's friends. That was at ten past eight. It was the last we know of anyone who talked to her. Do you mind if I um, do a little feed them, please? Yeah. I have a charcoal sandwich with aubergines and peppers. Yeah. And uh, I'll have the roast double of lamb. Thank you. Here's to you passing your driving test. And then I'll have to carry you around everywhere. <laughs> I'm going to try my best. <laughs> and then he came over. And he said, can I go out with you? Oh, my God, really?
I was driving along Spriggs Holly Lane towards Radnich and just past the Browns house on my left in an area locally known as the Triangle, I saw a car parked quite a way back off of the road. We take note of this sort of thing because of the burglars that have been around here in the past and it makes us suspicious if we see cars parked at this time of night. I've put the extra in because I had to No, dessert. don't be silly. No, no honestly. No, we'll split the bill. Sure. Yeah. Um, there's no easy way to tell you this. I've got some very sad news. We went to your house earlier today and we found a person there who was dead. We believe that person to be your mother. Michael Short with so little to go on, I suppose it's a bit naive to suggest that maybe someone went home with a lot of blood on them that night. I don't think so. For, without going into details, we know that the person who carried out this act must have been heavily bloodstained. And so I would appeal to anybody, friend, relative, who knows anything, to, to come forward. In addition, such a brute murder as that, somebody must have spoken. The person who did it must have confided in somebody. So I really would ask anybody to come forward to stop it happening again. In addition, there is a £10,000 reward. We're talking about Monday the 10th of April, which is the week leading up to Easter, and somebody that evening would have gone home with really a lot of blood. A lot, there's no doubt at all about that, a lot of blood. Now, the only other things that you might have as, as clues, we've got some things here which come from them. That taping of the window, which is a very peculiar thing to do, which was using this sellotape or weather tape, which is a sort of rather unusual thing, to, not only to do, but substance to use. That's right. It's not common. It's not the normal sellotape. It's used just to repair greenhouses and cloches. Um, sellotape have only supplied 1,300 in this year to local area. Local area. So it, it is unusual. And if you couple that with the other items... Now the other items are that this was used to, to restrain her as well. This is just all masking tape. And obviously, <laughs> people can buy that all over the place. These uh, handcuffs, which were used to restrain her as well, again, I mean, these presumably can uh, fairly common, these things. Yeah, they're, they're ever so common, and we certainly wouldn't be able to trace where they came from. But, and again, you've got to add to that the glass cutter, the which instrument that was used to, to break the window. All most unusual things. If you put them together, it could well mean something to somebody. So what you want is somebody who maybe sold somebody a whole variety of these things together, somebody who can put together a pic. A, a jigsaw puzzle, as it were. Absolutely, always. or anybody's seen people with it. Now, Janet Brown was going in her car, it seems, that evening, away from home at half past six. Now, what do you know about that? We know nothing. It's certainly she was going away from where she normally shopped and where she normally got petrol. So we would really like anybody to come forward who, who she went to, to meet, to visit. I, in addition, we still know very little about Janet. We'd like anybody that, a friend of hers, has seen her in restaurants, seen her anywhere, in the weeks leading up to her death to come forward. OK. Well, if there's any way that you can help, if you can eliminate that car scene in the local triangle, do please call. Detective Superintendent Michael Short and his team are waiting for your call, either here in the studio, 0500 600 600, or you can reach their colleagues in the incident room. That's on 01 296 396 333. 01 296, the code for Aylesbury, 396 333. Find nine-year-old Daniel Handley for Beckton in East London. He disappeared on Sunday, October the 2nd. But as the weeks turned into months, hopes of finding Daniel alive began to dwindle. And finally, on March the 27th, the investigation became a full-scale murder inquiry when a child's body was discovered near Bristol. So now, once again, we're appealing for your help. Detective Superintendent Ed Williams here is running the inquiry, and with his help, our film pieces together now as much as is known about Daniel's disappearance so far. Okay, then. I'll see you tomorrow, then. Bye. Soon after Daniel's mother reported his disappearance on the 2nd of October, we organised what is perhaps the biggest police search ever in London for a missing child. Daniel was riding a very, very distinctive bike at the time he disappeared. 
As you can see, it doesn't have a saddle. The frame of the bike was silver. On March the 27th, Daniel's remains were discovered on an isolated piece of land off Trench Lane near the Bradley Stoke estate on the outskirts of Bristol. We believe that Daniel was abducted by paedophiles. Maybe Daniel stopped off on the journey from London to Bristol on the motorway. Perhaps he was even kept here on the Bradley Stoke North Estate in a house on the estate. Discovery of a boy's body in French Lane. I wanted to ask you some questions. Yeah, certainly. It could be that Daniel was kept in Wales. One thing we are certain of is that Daniel's burial site was no accident. We believe that whoever left Daniel here knew this area. One of the things to come out of our investigation after the crime watch reconstruction was filmed was that at 6.30 p.m. on Sunday the 2nd of October, a passing motorist saw a silver or grey car and we're not certain of the make or model. A passenger from that car was actually talking to a boy that we believe was Daniel. There was a second man in the driver's seat. The motorist was concerned enough to turn and drive back. He saw the car pull across to the other side of Tollgate Road. These men have not come forward. It is vital that we find out who they are and anyone else who may have seen them. A short alleyway connects Tollgate Road with Wintergreen Close, which is where a short time later, Daniel's bike was found abandoned. Well, Ed, now that Daniel's body has been discovered in the Bristol area, that's opened up a whole new area of information there, hasn't it? It has indeed. And although I'm not in a position to release too much information at this stage for strategic reasons, it is correct to say that there have been a number of sightings of a child that we firmly believe to be Daniel. On the first occasion that Daniel was seen in the company of men, he looked fairly comfortable. But unfortunately, on the second occasion, he looked quite distressed. He appeared to be hoist between two men, held by the wrists, and was virtually a prisoner, we believe. And you are convinced that was Daniel, he was wearing the red tracksuit. We've got good cause to believe that we have reliable evidence that this was Daniel. How long do you think he was alive after being taken to Bristol? There's every possibility that he was alive for at least 10 to 12 days after being taken from London to Bristol. And you mentioned there a Wales connection. Do you think he might have been taken to Wales during that time? It's a possibility. He could have been taken over the Severn Bridge. He could have been kept in a holiday home, a caravan or a chalet, either in Wales or in the, the southwest somewhere. And I believe that if anybody has information uh, about a child recently taken, or after the 2nd of October, taken into a holiday community, I'd like them to contact us. Mm. And you're desperate to find the silver or grey saloon car and the people in it. Yes, I am. On the 2nd of October, 1994, when that car was parked in Tolgate Road, there were two men in that car. One of those men was on the pavement actually talking to Daniel. Now, neither of those men has come forward, and neither has the couple that were allegedly walking past at the time. I'm still anxious to trace those men, that couple, and that car, mm. which by now may well have been destroyed, abandoned, or indeed even stored somewhere. I'm anxious to hear from any member of the public who after the 2nd of October 1994, in London or in Bristol, knows of a silver or grey car that comes into the category of being a Lada, a Nissan or a Skoda that has been ab abandoned or burnt out or anything of that kind. If it's suspicious, let us know. Edwards, thank you very much. If you have seen anything, if anything you've just seen in the film has jogged your memory or awakened your suspicions in any way, if you saw that grey or silver saloon car and the two men near the Tollgate Road, please do call. You can ring the studio here tonight on 0500 600 600 or ring the incident room and that's 0181 503 1212. That's 0181 503 1212. A tragedy, an accident almost, but the sort of thing that makes people despair. Two children stealing from an old woman in the street. The woman, Mrs. Christina Gray, happened to have osteoporosis or brittle bone disease. 782, 72. Five in eight, fifty-eight. Turn four, twenty-four. One in eight, eighty. Seven in three, seventy-three. Six in three, sixty-three. Seven in four, seventy-four. Seven in eight, seventy-eight. Four, five, fifty-nine. thought that was going to be my lucky turn then. Yeah. How about you, Hick? Another three pounds down the drain. Oh. Never mind. Come on, let's go and have a coffee, Chris. Bingo was her main hobby. You know, it's a way of socialising. Got it.
she enjoyed life. She, she made the best out of what she had. The osteoporosis, when it hit her, she was bedridden. But I mean, that would last a week and then she'd be back out, up to bingo and feeding her cats. You know, cats were her main thing. She really had a will about her and a will to live. She was an amazing woman in the respect that there she is heading off up that, that hill, which I try and avoid at the best of times myself. Even if it was just to get her newspaper, she'd, that's what she had to get, she'd go. These boys were crossing the road in front of me and they were lurking around. They looked like two little boys up to mischief. They say I have a beady eye. And they, when they saw me, they hurried out. I couldn't see much of them because they had scarves and hats and I just thought, Two little boys up to mischief. Not evil. Security video shows Mrs. Gray and her friend left the club at 3.55. A witness saw two women walking up Lansdowne Place. One was Mrs. Gray. The other is crucial to the inquiry because of something she might have seen. Do you know who she is or where she was going? When I first turned into the road, um, it was nothing out of the ordinary. It's just as you get further down the road that I noticed there was something in the road there what on earth's that? Are you okay? Yeah. What's happened? Oh, I've, I've been attacked. Two black boys, they spun me round and threw me down. Then, then they ran off up there, up, up Fox Hill. I think I've done something to my leg. Oh, I, I just want to get home. It, it's just down the road. Mrs. Gray's hip was broken, and so was her arm. Five hours later, she died in hospital of her injuries and shock. Prime Burden Brown, the best we can say is they couldn't have meant to kill her. I accept that they possibly didn't mean to kill her, but nevertheless, this was a, a terribly cowardly attack on a frail, defenceless old lady. Uh, having said that, I do believe that uh, the lads responsible would have got a shock when they realised that they had in actual fact murdered Mrs Gray. And I also believe that uh, because of that, they, they will have spoken to somebody about what they actually did. And I would appeal, because there is a reward on offer, for anybody with information as to the identity of these kids to get in touch straight away. Well, if you can help, 0500 600 600, remember, call us here straight away. The kids were, I mean, they were only kids, probably 12, 14, we're not sure, sure, sure of their age. There was another witness, though, that you're very keen to see. We, we saw her briefly in the film, 
Uh, she's quite petite, right. five foot, who was walking up Lansdowne Place at the same Lansdowne Place at the same time. That's right. She was a few yards behind the victim, and I'm quite sure that she must have seen either the attack or, at the very least, uh, the lads run off after attacking Mrs. Gray. This is Saturday, the 18th of March. And there are some other people that you want to try and trace, again as witnesses, right. two young men seen in the area. Tell us about them. Well, they were seen on the morning of the attack on several occasions. We have an e-fit of the elder one of the two. He's described as black, aged about 20, 5 foot 10. He was scruffily dressed with unkempt Afro hair. And his companion was aged a bit younger, 16, 17, about 5 foot 7. We need to, to trace these people and to eliminate them if they can't help us with the inquiry. Okay, they could be brothers, I gather, from, from the description, but your they concern is that almost certainly they've seen something even they don't recognize its significance themselves. That's correct. Okay, please call us if there's any way you can help them, particularly if you think you know who these two main suspects are, the, the kids themselves, or if they've talked to you. 0500 600 600. Remember, it's a free call. And the detectives are here, but you can speak to a BBC researcher if you prefer, or call the Addington Police Station in South London Direct. That's on 0181 649 1414. 0181 649 1414. If you were there that night, perhaps you talked to her or saw who she was with. Anybody in town? 86, Bob, I'm in town. Get me Piccadilly 21 for Natalie. Roger. Is this taxi for Natalie? Yeah, Natalie, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Just get me mates. Well, she's with three white lads, basically. Student-y type. One was very tall, that I distinctively remember. Within shore, sure, please. The two lads in the back, I didn't get a really good look at. I could just describe them as two white males, about 5'10". So I was just thinking, I hope my dog hasn't done anything when I get home. She's only a puppy, she's called Sasha, she's gorgeous. Natalie was keeping the conversation alive by doing all the talking and gibbering on about a dog. What kind of a night have you had? Is that a good night? I passed one or two questions, but they didn't want to know, they didn't want to tell me anything. What club did you go to? Did you go to that uh, 21 club? Could you pull up at the next petrol station so we can get some cigs and some crisps in that, please? OK, yeah, it's just through the lights. Cheers. Just here, Lee, thanks. OK, that's uh, £7.80, please. OK. It's good, in it? Three lads, and I've still got to pay. Smash in. Oops. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. See ya. See you again, Bye. Mom. Were these old friends of hers, or had she just met them that night? Either way, police need to hear from them. Come on. Come on. There are no confirmed sightings of Natalie after that night. If she was still alive on the Saturday, she would certainly have spent some of the time at her flat. That Saturday evening, the neighbour downstairs heard a lot of noise coming from Natalie's flat. The banging was getting on my nerves, so I slammed the door to the sitting room, opened it to make him stop, but it carried on. An hour and a half later, It was four days after that that Natalie's body was found. She'd been stabbed several times. Now, Mr Baldwin, do you have any theories why anybody would have wanted to kill Natalie? Well, it was eight weeks ago tonight since Natalie's body was found by her mum. Since then, we've made a number of enquiries, but we're unable to tell at this stage why Natalie should have been attacked and killed. Nothing was missing from her flat? No, she'd only been in the flat for about a month. 
and we obviously need to speak to anyone who's visited her there or who knows of anybody else who's visited her in that time. Yeah, what, what sort of period are we talking about that you need to, people who need to come forward and talk to you? We've had a good response from people who saw Natalie during the week prior to Easter, but we need to speak to anyone who saw her between Thursday the 13th of April, which was the day before Good Friday, and Thursday the 20th when her body was found. Now, the man in the red jacket that somebody saw her with at the bus station was before that time, wasn't it? That was the day before Good Friday. That was a sighting by someone who knows Natalie well, and we're quite satisfied that that was the time and date. We do know he's about 28, about 5 foot 11. He had collar-length blonde hair, which was greasy. So we still need to eliminate him. But you do have one witness who saw somebody else with Natalie a couple of days later at the same bus station at about the same time of the morning. We're not altogether certain about the date, but it was the same bus station and about the same time of day. This was a younger man. He was in his late teens or early 20s. He had black hair, which was shaved at the sides and the back. He was also about 5 foot 11 but his hair was blonde on top, blonde streaks. He had a scar on his face which went from his nose down to his top lip and across his left cheek. On the back of his right hand, he had a very distinctive tattoo which looked like a bird in flight and two lines of dots on his knuckles. We think he may have used the name Paul. And as Natalie and this individual walked away from the bus station towards Portland Street, he was speaking to her in a very aggressive way and was either pushing her or punching her in the back as they walked. Mm. But the last actual definite sighting of Natalie was uh, by that taxi driver after she left the Piccadilly 21 Club with those three lads. As things stand at the moment, these three lads are some of the last people to have seen Natalie alive. We really need these people to come forward. The descriptions we've got of them are not too good. Student types, one of them was particularly tall. It may be that they recalled the taxi journey back to Withenshaw calling at the garage for cigarettes and crisps. Perhaps they remember seeing Natalie's dog with a bandaged leg when they got back, but we do need to come fo them to come forward so that we can eliminate them from our inquiries. Right, and that was the 13th of April, late Thursday night, the small hours of Good Friday. That was the 14th of April. And uh, there's an unusually large reward in this put up by the police and Natalie's family. If you knew Natalie, if you met her or you saw her in the few days leading up to the Easter weekend, please ring and help Mr Boardman try to build up an accurate picture of Natalie's life at the time she died. The number here, 0500 600 600, or you can ring the incident room on their direct line, 0161 856 4300. That's 0161, the code for Manchester, 856 4300. If you live near Clacton in Essex, you might be able to help with our last case tonight. Simon Shannon was a shy, sensitive young man, a bit of a loner. There seems no possible reason why anyone would hold a grudge against him. But sometime between Wednesday the 3rd and Saturday the 6th of May, he was stabbed to death in his flat. It was only when a neighbour noticed the bottles of milk beginning to accumulate on Simon's doorstep that the police were called. Simon Shannon was 26 years old. He was found dead in his flat by a police officer on Saturday about 11 o'clock in the morning. He'd been strangled, he'd got serious internal injuries, his throat had been cut. We know that he's lived in the flat in Groom Park for about five years. We know that he is an adopted boy. He comes from a big family. Simon uh, was my son. And as a father, you have a special relationship. And all that has been taken from us. Simon was a, a very quiet person. He, right from an early age, he'd like to have his own space and his own privacy. He didn't like to be part of a group of people. He liked to be on his own, doing his own thing. Now, the problem is, we don't know very much about Simon since he moved away from his parents' home. What we need to do is find out a lot more about him. So let's get down to Clacton, let's do our inquiries and find out as much as we can. Simon was about 17 years old mm -hmm. when he came to see us. Um, we run like a guest house and Simon lived with us for about three years. And we became very fond of Simon. Mm -hmm. And he remained friends with you after he'd left here, did he? Oh, yes. Simon would come here two or three times a week. I'd be working away in the kitchen and all of a sudden Simon would appear out there. He would just stand there. And until I actually looked and saw Simon, he wouldn't knock or ring the doorbell, and I'd just say, come on in, Simon. Simon had this amazing talent. He loved to paint. 
everywhere you go in this house, Simon's painted something in every room. We're going to have to find the people that he's given or sold a painting to. We've got a statement here from a woman that saw two men leaving Simon's address on Tuesday 2nd of May, and one of them was carrying a painting. It's about 4 to 4.15 in the afternoon, and as she entered Groom Park, she saw these two men coming up the footpath of Simon's house. She's given a couple of good descriptions. Anything else that we need to change? The mouth was smaller. How about that? She says in her statement that the man carrying the picture was 25 to 26 years of age, five foot seven, medium build, yeah, shoulder length blonde, blonde hair. hair, which was wavy and unkempt, you know, it wasn't brushed. The second man was about the same age, about 26, and he was a bit taller, five foot eight to nine, I'd say, slim build. He had dark collar length hair, which was wavy and a bit longer on top. We now have a better idea of the places he visited. There's two I've come across which are in Clapton. The first one is the Warwick Castle Market, or Boot Fair as it's often known. We've got a lot of sightings of him there in a very distinctive mauve jacket, and also at the library, again in Clapton, and we've got a definite sighting of him there on the Monday morning before the body was found. Yeah, we've found someone and saw him in Safeway Supermarket on Tuesday. There are other possible sightings of him, but uh, at this stage we don't know if that's just someone that looks like Simon. What's important about During that? the first week of the investigation, two more witnesses had emerged. Oh, my left arm is up and comes. I really was quite taken aback. I mean, it was dark and he just took me totally by surprise. Um, he did appear to be waiting for somebody. What did he look like? He was about 18 to 23 years old. Uh, medium build with a bit of a belly. He was about five foot one inch tall. And he had light brown or fair hair. Uh, he had a rounded face. Across the road from Simon's flat, the second witness saw something in the small hours of the day Simon's body was found. And you saw that on Saturday the 6th of May? Yeah, I was in the kitchen at the time. And what time was it? Uh, about 3 a.m. As I went across the junction of St Anne's Road, St Mary's Road, I thought it was going to collide with the wall. It looked light in colour, like an old-style minivan. And why didn't you report this to us early then, Joe? Well, I didn't really think much of it at the time until I heard about the, the guy being found dead across the road. It's a very difficult situation to, to come to terms with. I never knew, until this happened, what it meant to be gutted. Well, Mr Seal, because Simon was such a quiet sort of person, you presumably feel there's a lot more about him that you need to know. Yes, he was very shy, and we found out almost nothing about his movements and where he was, who he saw, on the Wednesday and the Thursday before his body was found. We know that he's walked around uh, Clacton with a number of different men, only one of whom has come forward, and we need to trace them. And we know that he's written around the country through gay contact um, magazines, and he's written, making, may try to make friends in writing. We need to contact these. So it could be connections anywhere in the UK, in fact? Yes, it could. He painted a lot, didn't he? Why do you need to hear from many people he gave or sold paintings to? He was a very, very talented artist. He's done paintings on commission, and he's given paintings away. And we're trying to trace the people who he's done these paintings for, so that we can uh, build up our knowledge on him. Mm. As we can see, he either signed them Simon Shannon or SS or S Shannon. Yes, he did. The two specific people, of course, that you want to eliminate from the inquiry are the two people we saw in the film, the men coming out of Simon's flat carrying what could have been a painting. Yes. The, um, the one with the blonde hair is described as in his mid-twenties. He's of medium build. He's about five foot six. And the man with the darker hair is a little taller. He's about five foot eight or five foot nine. Um, the dark hair is longer on top. He's in his mid-twenties and he's of medium build. Right. And you've just discovered now there's another man you need to trace. A new witness has come forward with new information. Yes, a witness has come forward having seen the, the, the first effects of these two men. And the man he describes definitely not that blonde man because he's six foot one of medium build. But he's got blonde hair. And we know that he's been seen going to Simon's flat uh, on four separate occasions between January and May this year. Mm. 
Now, this is a sensitive case for you to investigate, isn't it? Particularly as Simon was gay. Some people might feel reluctant to come forward at all. Yes, I can understand that, but they really shouldn't be because we will treat them with care, respect and sympathy and we just want to hear from people who can help us. Right, thanks. Well, please do ring if you can help at all. We need to hear from you. Here's a studio number, 0500 600 600. Or you can contact Essex Police Headquarters where, incidentally, there's a gay officer on the investigation team. That number is 01245 452 120. That's 01245, the code for Chelmsford, 452120. A precious few clues. All detectives hope for is that someone in Oxfordshire has their conscience stirred and comes forward with their suspicions. It's frankly one of those crimes that, however rare, far less than one's chance of being struck by lightning and all that stuff, is nonetheless very hard indeed to solve without someone calling in with names and sightings. The victim was Vicky Thompson, who lived in Ascot under Witchwood. Vicky was a... Just, I just can't describe how she was. She was just a very loving mother. She was a very caring wife. She always found time time for me and for the children. She put 100% of energy into everything that she did. I think I drank too much last night. Any breakfast left? You wait a bit. I'm about to get the kids lunch. Hey, what's this? Jonathan, he's going to take Daisy for a walk. OK. I'll try and give your car a wash. It's filthy. Bye. Bye. Half a mile away, a local man was walking past King Standing Farm near the Charlbridge of Burford Road. As I peeked through the hedge, I could see this man stood there with no clothes on. And as I moved towards the hedge, he moved away. The next time I see the man, he's running across the cornfield. I could see then that he was six foot tall, very pale, thin, between 20 and 30 years old. If you leave it there, I'll trip over it. At about 4.15pm on the London to Hereford main line, did you see anyone near the track between Charlbury and Kingham that day, Saturday the 12th of August? Daisy came back without mummy. Ah, oh, she's probably walking slowly. Daisy runs faster than Mummy. Keith? When Daisy came home on her own, I didn't immediately see any cause for concern, as I expected that Vicky would soon come round the corner, that maybe she'd sent Daisy up the road and was talking to a friend. But as time wore on, I realised that something wasn't right. <laughs> Strap in now. I needed to go out and look for her. When I got back to the house, I half expected to see her there. Um, I was quite surprised when she wasn't there and realised I needed to go straight back out. So I left a note on the table and took my phone with me. seen Vicky, have you? No, we haven't. Of course, come on without her. Been up to the lane, there's no sign of her. Well, look, we'll go down and have another look. Jonathan, I haven't heard from you for... Vicky's not with you, is she? She's missing. I thought she might drop by your place for tea on her way back or something. No, no, she definitely hasn't been around here. 
Look, I'm popping down the lane in a minute, so I'll, I'll have a look if you want. Found this on the lane. Carolyn's sure it's Vicky's. I became more and more frantic and was very upset about the fact that I couldn't find her and just needed her to come round the corner and see everything was all right. I tried to keep the horrible thoughts that could have happened to her at the back of my mind for the sake of the children. Hello, look, I'm sorry to bother you. Um, there's this woman missing. Her name's Vicky. Um, we found her bracelet. We've informed the police and everything, but you haven't seen anyone, have you? She's about five foot no, slim. No, I haven't seen anyone. Um, obviously, we'll keep a lookout. A bit of a state there, Chad, didn't they? What's that? Oh, God. Look. Peter. What's that? Look. No, don't go in there, look. I'll go and get that bloke. I was terrified that the attacker might still be in the area. Hello! Excuse me! You can't quite we found something! Where about? There, in the field! Where? Run to the nearest house. Call an ambulance. Yeah, by the way, Echo 41, Oxford Way, Ask Under Witchwood. I believe we may have a sighting of Vicky Thompson. Just going to see if confirmed. Vicky had been beaten around the head, but there was no obvious motive for the crime. She died six days afterwards. David Blair, this has had a great deal of publicity, locally and nationally. How can people help further? I really want someone who may think they know who's done this, maybe sheltering them even, to come forward and tell us. It's really important. It's one of our main sort of lines of inquiry here. How would people know? How would they have any suspicions? Well, it might be from the demeanor of the person, uh, or it might be that uh, they were disposing of some clothing or something like this. There's no doubt that the offender's clothing would have been bloodstained in this case. His behaviour, would it have been changed anyway? Probably would have been a bit abnormal, yes. C could well have been, for a little while afterwards, certainly. Now, we haven't got many clues to go on. Th there would have been a lot of people in that area. I mean, it's, it's a holiday area. This is the peak of the holiday season. That's right. Um, certainly there were campers, caravanners, there would have been um, hikers, walkers in the village. We've interviewed a lot of people in the village, of course, but anyone else who, ha who was there in Ascot under Witchwood on that Saturday afternoon, we would really like to talk to them, whether or not they think they know anything or saw anything. One of them, or somebody, might have found uh, this, or at least an, an identical one. This is a, a Flexi 3 dog lead. Now, if somebody has found this, what do you want to hear? If somebody's found this, um, it would have been around the Ascot under Witchwood area, no doubt, on the Saturday or the Sunday. Um, please come forward and let us know. Um, or indeed, the offender himself may still be in possession of it. Okay, but you only want it from the Oxfordshire area. You don't want to call it from the rest of the no, country. No, 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 indeed not. About that. There's uh, a reward in this case. We're offering a £10,000 reward for any information. Um, a generous reward, I feel. Okay, well, let's hope uh, somebody tonight can uh, call in with some help. Here's the number. Uh, it's a free call if you can help. You don't have to give your name if you don't want to. Simply call, though, please, if you have any information or any suspicions. If you prefer to call the uh, local police, uh, please do. Here's the number, 01865 266 650. That's 01865 266 650. Now, it's horribly real. Why should a man, by all accounts a, a nice guy who still lives at home with his mum, change his regular routine, indeed change his lifestyle for three days, and why at the end of that long weekend should somebody kill him? 
Just outside Edinburgh, South Queensferry sits between the two famous bridges that span the Firth of Forth. Robert Higgins was known to everyone. He lived nearby in the village of Dalmini. Which one's all right then, son? Aye, fine. Ask me till next week. Are you going to go across to fight his brother then? No, I can't. I've not got any money. Oh, that's me. I'll have to go. Do you want anything for the shops? No, I'm all right. OK, then. Cheerio. See you later. There's five children in the family. And Robert was the third one. He started playing football when he was 12, and he carried on till he was 16, 17. And it could have really meant something, I think, in the end, because he had good motivation with the ball. Robert was a very quiet person. He would never um, harm anybody. Robert worked at a poultry farm at Newbridge, and um, it was very physical work. It was quite a demanding job and shifts and things like that. As well. and that's what he did Monday till Thursday. He was very quiet through the week, he never went out, but at the weekend he did go out and have a drink and sometimes too much. Uh, I've got can cook for me. Okay. 80. Okay. Uh, Put some music on. Cheers. Oh, so we're going to have to cut list in the night. Why, right, where do you want to go? Cutlands. Aye. I haven't been for a while. We'll take the next bus. We'll get a bus. We'll get a taxi. Oh, come on, Higgy. It's just two minutes up the road. We'll get a bus. You don't get me on the bus. Look, I've got the money. We'll get a taxi. You're daft. Aye, fair enough. Hey, Bob. Good night, Bob. Higgy had come in with some friends about half past eight, and the friends left about half past eleven. So he just sat himself and finished off his drink. Uh, OK. I'll just finish this wee bit off, aye. He left about 12 o'clock, went down the stairs as usual. Right, get Right, right. Let's put the jacket on. Cheers. When in Kirkliston, Robert would often doss down with a friend or get a taxi home. Tonight, the friend was busy, and at first Robert couldn't get a taxi. He was still in Main Street, Kirkliston, at 2 a.m. He didn't go home on the Thursday night. He obviously had somewhere that he was going to. And I found it quite unusual that he didn't phone my mum, which he would normally do. He would always phone my mum to say he was stopping out. But by 11.30 on Friday morning, alone at a local hotel, Robert was seen again. Why was he here? And where did he spend Friday lunchtime until the early evening? It was about quarter to eight, and I was on my way to the shop, and I saw Higgy standing outside the King's Retreat. He was speaking to a man in his late 30s to early 40s, about five foot eight to five foot ten, and had dark brown hair. We found that really unusual with Robert not going into the Queen's, um, so he must have been waiting on someone outside, um, and it was a Friday night, so he hasn't still phone, phoned home and he still hasn't contacted the family in any way. Then, for the second morning running, Robert turned up alone at the Forth Bridges. Who was he staying with nearby? And again, where did he spend the rest of the day? This is just outside the Fourth Bridges Hotel. I was going to the bingo at the ex servicemen's club in South Queen's Ferry, and I got off the bus at the south side toll, and I looked right and saw Robert walking down from the flyover, and I just had a quick glance and walked on. I don't know where he went, but it's a possibility that he was going down into South Queen's Ferry itself. That was another strange thing Robert did. He's been seen, but um, not in any of his locals. I mean, so where has he been? He, and he must have been with somebody that he's known. And he hasn't even bothered contacting the family on the Saturday again. It was 
Sunday I'd been to Queensbury Parish Church and I left there about 11.20. I went into Morrison Gardens and I saw Robert coming along the road. I knew Robert from school, but the people he was with I didn't know. I thought that they were looking quite worse for wear. Were you among this group? Or do you know who they were? Robert wouldn't sleep well. He wasn't the type of person who would just go to a park bench, sit down, go to sleep. He was scared of the dark. I can't imagine him sleeping out in the dark. You know, he certainly, we feel Robert stayed somewhere over that weekend. Um, we feel someone maybe seen Robert coming and going that weekend. Next day, Monday the 1st of May, Robert Higgins' body was discovered at a quarry three miles from his home. He'd been stabbed. Superintendent Jackie Watson, you're convinced this is a local crime. Local people have the solution to it. Yes, this has been a local inquiry, and the answer almost certainly lies locally. But tonight's reconstruction gives the community in South Queen's Ferry and Kitwiston uh, the first opportunity to really see the sequence of events that leads up to the Robert Higgins' death that weekend. And we hope this will jog some memories. But, but more importantly, I feel that Higgy was such a well-known character uh, in that community that I feel the information that's been coming into us has been very, very slow, simply because the public there feel that we know that information already, and that's just not the case. What we need from that community is every single piece of information they have about Robert Higgins and his movements that weekend, especially where he spent the missing nights that weekend. Somebody out there in that community knows exactly where Robert Higgins stayed on these missing nights, and my appeal is simple. Let us have that information. 0500 600 600, 0500 600 600 is our free call here. Now that couple in Morrison Gardens, you've got quite good descriptions of them now since we did that reconstruction, particularly the woman. Yes, the female, but she's slightly different from the person portrayed in the reconstruction. She's slim to medium build and around five foot five, but she's white, 45 to 55, black curly perm, colour length hair, wearing a blouson style jacket and light coloured trousers. The jacket itself is light coloured as well. Uh, the male, he's 35, 30 to 45, Sorry, five foot eight, five foot nine, short brown hair, clean shaven, uh, casually dressed with a casual shirt, but also wearing a suit style jacket. Now back on the Friday night, that's what, the 28th of April, just after he was seen outside the Queen's Retreat, that was about 7.45, he was seen with another man, we saw that in the reconstruction, yeah. he was seen again with a couple. Yeah, around nine o'clock uh, that night, uh, Robert was seen in Rosebury Avenue uh, with a couple, own females described, and she's described as being white, in her 40s, heavy build, Fair hair, cut short at the back, but longer on the top, uh, wearing a black dress style jacket and clutching uh, a shoulder strap for a, for a black shiny shoulder bag. And again, you feel that she's got to be a local person. Robert's family obviously distraught about this. They managed to, to get together a reward. Tell us about that. Yes, by various activities in the local community, Robert, uh, Robert's family and the relatives and friends have gotten together and raised uh, £2,000. That's the reward that's up. Uh, for anyone who gives us information which leads to the arrest of uh, and subsequent conviction of the person or persons responsible for Robert Higgins' murder. Well, if you want to call uh, Mr Watson, call here. If you want to call the local police direct, the incident room is at Livingston. It's on 01506 445 655. That's 01506 445 655. The killing of Louise Sellers. Now, Louise was 15. She lived in Apley Bridge near Wigan with her parents and younger brother and sister. Louise was an absolutely fun-loving girl. She loved to go out with her mates. She loved to have a dance on a Friday night. She was doing really well at school. She had her life planned out to be a PE teacher. Um, she was going to uh, college. And she had everything set. Everything set. Oh, she was bubbly. Um, vivacious, I would say. It describes her to a T, really. She was uh, everybody's friend, and you could not fail to like Louise. You know, she was, I'm not saying she was an angel, <laughs> she was just like every other teenager, but she just had that bit more. What are you looking for? Sure. Oh, what about those there? Let me try. Listen, I'm not feeling too well. I think I'm going to go up. Right. Can you do washing up for me? All right. You're going to go out tonight? I'm going to phone some friends, might meet up. Well, don't be too long on that phone, will you? Hello? Hi, Ed. Oh, Louise. Do you want 
to meet up? This evening? Yeah, tell you what, we'll meet at the late shop and we can walk down. Yeah, OK. Er, uh, what time? Well, what's best for you? Er, uh, 6.30. All right, I've got loads of gossip to tell you. No, not now. You'll have to wait. <laughs> Dad, is mum still asleep? Yeah, probably, why? She wants some money. Well, I think she is still asleep, and so don't you go waking her up. Louise, come back. Mum? Mm hmm? Can I have some money? How much? Just a quid for a couple of cans of Coke. Oh. Where are you going? Just to meet some friends. OK, I'll see you later. Yeah. See ya. Right, bye. See ya. Hiya. Oh, yeah. All right, what's the gossip then? Well, I went to the park nightclub on Friday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a fight bouncer standing in the queue. What, next to you? Yeah, these guys were trying to get in the club, but the bouncers wouldn't let them in. But you got in, though, didn't you? Yeah. I ended up falling out with Jane, though. Why? She just really got on my nerves. Have you moved the sugar? Because I trapped off with this guy called Andrew. And he gave me his ring. I'm going to give it him back tonight, though. I was supposed to give it him back before we left the club, but I just forgot. Yeah. Hiya. Hiya. Where are you go? Yeah. Where have you been? What, what? Where are you going? I've just been attacked. Is she got any point on that? that was She's got anything to drink from this sort of dinner. Come on, get in. We're only going to Wang's house. No, not tonight. I'm too tired. Well, where are you off to? I think I'll go home. See ya. It's about 9.15pm and Kelly presumed Louise was going home. But ten minutes later... Hiya. Michelle, you're never going to believe what's just happened. What? I was standing at the bus stop at Randall's Corner and this bloke pulled up in his car and asked me if I want a lift. So I said no. He tells me to get lost and calls me a slag. Are you kidding? No. It's now around 9.30. I was travelling along Miles Lane when I noticed Louise on the right-hand side of the road. She was walking in between Chiseaka Drive and Aberdale, heading towards Randall's Corner. Five minutes later, a local resident saw what appeared to be Louise standing by the bus stop talking to two men in a white Ford Escort. Moments later, just up the road... Was this the same white car? And was Louise inside? Oh, I hate people like Don't be annoying. Yeah. Who did you tell Louise she had to be in? Well, it's Sunday. She's normally back by half past ten, and now it's... Nearly eleven. Louise was very good at yeah. coming home, but if she's going to be any later, she would always ring us um, to let us know where she was and what time she was going to be in. So obviously when she didn't ring or, or let us know by 11 o'clock where she was, that's when we really did start to worry. Oh, hi. It's Elaine Sellers here. Um, you haven't seen Louise, have you, tonight? No, no, and she hasn't come back yet. It's um, Elaine Sellers here, uh, Louise's mum. Uh, I'm sorry to bother you at this time of night. I know it's a bit late. Elaine Sellers here. Yes, um, has your daughter seen Louise tonight at all? We, we, I just wondered if you'd seen her at all tonight. Well, I am, I am. I mean, do you think, who else can I ring? Hello, is that Mrs. Morrissey? Hello, it, it's Elaine Sellers here, Louise's mum. Um, is Kelly in by any chance? Yeah, yeah, could I have a word with her? Could you ask her if she's seen Louise tonight? Kelly. Mm -hmm. Louise's mum's on the phone. She wants to know what time you left, Louise. She's not come in yet. Nine, nine twenty. Why? What time is it now? It's nearly midnight. Has she gone missing before? Never. She'd never leave us worrying like this. Where's your husband at the moment? Louise! Could you circulate that description, please? Thank you. Don't worry, there's lots of officers looking for him. There's definitely something wrong. Louise! 
Early the next morning, Louise's body was discovered near Billinge, five miles from her home. She'd been strangled. The tragic fate of Louise Sellers. Well, Peter Mockett is in charge of the inquiry. Peter, in addition to the two white cars we saw in the film, I think you have new information on a third white car, which may or may not be the same one. It may be the same one. Yes, we have a sighting of a white Ford Escort uh, with a fin on the back, which was seen in Miles Lane around about half past nine. The driver is described as 21 years of age with facial stubble, and he's wearing some distinctive clothing. Yes, I think he was wearing a baseball cap rather like this, wasn't he? Blue and red. A blue, blue cap with a red... With a, with a red red peak. peak rather, and yeah. also a T-shirt with a distinctive marking on it as yes, well. Yes, it's got no fear on it, the black T-shirt with no fear written on it. And you presumably desperately want to trace Louise's movements after 9.30. Very much so. We've got plenty of sightings up until 9.30. It's drastically important that we find where she went after 9.30. Now, the scene where her body was found in Billinge is a popular place, isn't it, for walkers, courting couples? It is. We'd appeal to anyone who was in, in the vicinity on the evening of the 13th or into the early hours of the 14th who was about, who saw anything remotely suspicious, vehicles of people. Some items found in the area. Tell us about these. This yes, this is a cassette tape which was found quite near to Lu where Louise was found. As you can see, it's got a handwritten label on either side. Dune May 93 is on one side and Vertigo on the other. It wasn't Louise's. And another cassette case, I think. Yes, that was found in the location. Tenerife Holiday, it's called. We know that it was produced in Tenerife this year. We're desperately keen to find the owners of those two cassette tapes. Now, the person who committed this dreadful crime must have acted strange afterwards. You can only imagine so. It's a terrible, grave crime, the loss of a young girl's life. If anyone knows anything, if the person's confided in a family member or a partner, please come forward, please tell us. It's desperately important. Absolutely, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. And I just must add that there is a substantial reward offered in this case as well. So if you feel that you can help police in any way, you can call them direct on 0161 856 7085. That's Manchester, 0161 856 7085. Since the peace process began, Northern Ireland has seen economic revival and a tourist boom. In late July, thousands of visitors were in County Antrim, basking in the sunshine, playing golf, walking in the rolling hills, and visiting the Giants' Causeway. Now, if you were there on Friday, July the 28th, please watch what follows closely. You might help solve the murder of 13-year-old Darren Fawns. Sister give me four fans for doing her long. And look, I fix your heads as well. Thanks, Miss Simpson. I remember if there's anything you ever need to do, just ask. He never ever went to Andy and asked him for money for nothing. He always used to want to earn that money. And that was one of the main ways he done it, was doing gardening for them. He was very outgoing and friendly. Very friendly. My mother sent him a T-shirt from England with dolphins on the front. And there was a pensioner that lives behind us. And she seen Dan in the T-shirt. And she liked it. So Dan came home, took it off, put on another T-shirt, and gave the pensioner a T-shirt that he was wearing, the one with the dolphins. That's the sort of boy he was. He always used to come up and say, would you, would you want a cup of tea, Mama? You know, and used to bring me a cup of tea up, or if I couldn't do something, I'll do that for you. The other way. No, the other way. Oh, Darren, over a bit. No, the next one. Yes, those. Them? Oh, come on, Mum. I'd be embarrassed if you wore these in public. Look, these are much nicer. Okay, bring them over. On the evening of Friday, July the 28th, Darren and his mother went to the castle shopping centre in Antrim town. Sorry. After I got the shoes, we put them in the steward's bag that I have my bingo board in, and he carried it up the shopping centre for me. Out to... The arcade there, and I says, I'll take that some of your right. And he says, I'm okay, Mum. I says, Well, I'll see you just after 10, between 10 and 10 past. 
Folks, see it come. Don't be late. Waiting on the bus to Belfast. Supposed to be here half an hour ago. Grab a smoke. Oh, come on, PJ, don't be stingy. Police need help in tracing this boy who was hanging around with Darren. He was standing looking around him and just looking about. He was roughly around the same age as Darren, black hair, blackish clothes, and I've never really seen him before. What about you, Pans? Oh, right then. Yeah, was that your mummy I saw you with earlier on the shots? Yep. Darren seemed very happy the night I was talking to him. He was a chatty, usual, smiling self. He was just as nice as he always has been to me. Darren, or Fonzie to his friends, spent much of that afternoon and evening in the town's amusement arcade, known locally as the Pleasure Drone or Roller Drone. Granddad, I don't like this one. There, don't waste your money on that one. It's bust. This was about half an hour before Darren was due to meet his mother. I don't try any of them either. I've lost money in them. Here we fell. I'll show you in another just now. Okay, here we go. All right, good start. That one. Okay, and again. All right, one other place here. Right. So put more money in. I didn't know Darren, but he seemed so kind and gentle. And him and Jonathan, my grandson, were on like a house on fire, and I felt quite free to leave him and go and have a cup of coffee. Thank you very much. In the next half hour or so, Darren must have met somebody else. But who? His mother waited at the cab rank as agreed, but by 10 past 10, Darren still hadn't shown. Look, uh, maybe he's still at the roller drum. Uh, could you take me round there on the way round? I can, surely, yes. Go ahead. I was worried. Because if he said he was going to be there, he would be there. Yet 30 minutes later, as the roller drone closed, Darren was seen leaving. Right, Fawn, see you tomorrow. All right, I'm through. Two boys, both roughly his age. Who were they? And where were they going? Five days later, a mile from the town centre, a Belgian tourist searching for a ball found Darren lying in bushes between the golf course and a holiday caravan site. Darren had been struck on the head. Those two lads who left the roller drone with him are obviously key witnesses. They're not suspects. We need them to come forward tonight urgently. And Mr Kincaid, what else is there? I mean, you wanted a national appeal on this. Yes, sir. Well, uh, one of the important things is the caravan site. Uh, it's called the Six Mile Water Caravan Park, but the locals call it the Loch Shore Caravan Park. On the 28th to the 30th of July, there was a considerable amount of caravans and tents at that park. Many of the people there came from Great Britain, and Darren's body was found only a few yards away in a, in a wood. 
Now, if you were there, I would ask you to please to call us at Antrim or call us here. That's the very end of July, 28th, 28th to 30th, 30th of July. July. Yes, and you may have heard or seen something which to you is very insignificant. It could be important to us to find the killer. So even if you don't think you saw anything related to this, you want them to call? If you stayed at that caravan park, please call us. Now, these are Darren's shoes. And they weren't found with his body, they were handed into you. What's the significance of these and how can viewers help? Well, those shoes were recovered the day after we, we found Darren's body. And uh, we would like to hear from anyone who saw those shoes between the 28th and the 30th of July in Antrim. Uh, they're a black size 9 Nike Air Max trainer with a very distinctive green stripe on them. Now, you're not sure whether he was killed on the Friday night or, or the Saturday morning, and, and obviously you want the people who might have seen him. That's correct. We're, we're unsure of the exact time of Darren's death, but we do know that five hours before he died, he did eat a meal, and that meal contained um, either pork or beef. Now, if we knew where he obtained that meal, it would give us uh, the exact time of his death and give us more information about his movements. So if anyone saw Darren eating over the weekend that we're looking for, for the information, would you please contact us? Okay. And particularly to two people who wrote uh, anonymous letters, we need to find out who you are. Our number to the studio is free. Pre please ring us if you know what happened that night. Please help however minor you think your information. You can call the police in Antrim Direct. That's on 01232 259 659. It's a Belfast number, 01232 259 659. In our next reconstruction, frankly, not much appears to happen. It was an ordinary day in summer in an ordinary former mining village in West Yorkshire in the life of an ordinary, if genuinely popular, local character. The village is called Charleston. The date was Thursday, August the 24th, and the local character was a widower, Don Herbert. My granddad lives on his own. It, with him having emphysema from working in the mines, my mum has to go twice a day to look after him. She does everything for him. And with her going for a week's holiday, she asked me if I'd go to look after him. So he went on his own. Slept through then? Yeah, I did, love. First time for a long time. Yeah, but man, it's a bit cooler now. Yeah, it's been a bit much, hasn't it? Are you still going to the shop? I'll pop in on my way after work. And don't forget my whiskey, love. I want the gas cylinder for the soda stream. And what about your tea? Have you got old tin? No, I haven't, but I'll get some fishing. Oh, all right then. Well, I've got to finish off because I've got to get to work. All right. Thanks, love. My dad spent most of his life in Charleston, just a small village between Pontefract and Wakefield. He worked at Charleston Colliery, and he started work when he was 15 years old. And he finished when he was uh, 54. And then he looked after my mum, because she always had an heart condition. One day he'd be 21, next day he'd be 90. And it don't matter what you said to him to look after himself, he still liked to enjoy himself. But he liked everybody else to enjoy themselves as well. I've cashed my pension, and with all that money in my wallet, it's burning a hole in my backside. Listen, can, can you do us a favour? What's that, Don? If you go to shops, can you get us some beans? So I've known Don for about four or five years. Nice gentleman, kind fellow, he'll give you anything. Yeah, do. Thanks. Now, what time do you want to meet at Villa? A Villa is a working man's club. And we'd meet there every day and have a drink and a bit Bye. of a letter. Sometime mid-morning, Don would have left his flat. Because of his illness, he used a mobility buggy to get about the village. He was seen soon after by his niece. I was uh, coming home from work. I work in Wakefield and I was getting off the bus in Charleston. It was around about 10 to 11. I got off the bus and I was walking down home and I met up with my uncle Don and he was with the man. Hello then, where are you off? Fine. You all right then? Yeah, I'm fine. You know this fella, don't you? Dave, he used to stay with me. Yeah, he thought I did recognise him, but I didn't. He was about 38 to 40. He was like 5 foot 9, 5 foot 10 tall. He got darkish, scraggly hair and he got right drawn in face. Don arrived at the villa sometime around 1 that afternoon, but without Dave. Who is Dave and where had he gone? Hello, lads. 
Hey, hey, Dom. Dom. All right. They were a character. There's characters in every village, and Don was just one of them. He would a laugh. I could always go and sit with Glenn and Don and Barry, and they were always made welcome. Any chance of a lift down it, Jeep? Certainly. No, we all right. Certainly. Get on top. Don would give any, anybody anything. He was good as gold, salt to earth, and he was just a genuine guy. Well, that's nice, isn't it? Mates for all these years. Buddy, can he, is he allowed to come with me? No. That's right. Got to get over there, having the fish. Get the fish down the neck. Me and they, then I'm going up there. We'll have an hour, then, eh? At around 3.30, Don went home to spend the rest of the day at his flat. Do you know you had me fetch that bottle of whiskey? Yeah. Well, there's half a bottle left in cupboard. Well, you've got to be prepared. Mm. Here, try one of these. Oh, are these from Greenhouse? Yeah. Sun's been beautiful. I left it 20 past five and was in a lovely mood. He felt a lot better than he had done all week. Take them. I can pick some more. Are you sure? Mm, positive. Yeah, right, Oh, yes, fine. That's Here's good. your wine. Right, thank you. You want some of these for the wife? Uh, That'd be a good swap, wouldn't it? That evening, a resident saw a man walking in the close a few yards from Don's house. He didn't visit any of the neighbours. Who was he, and what was he doing there? I've known Don for about 30 years. Since I became his neighbour, he's taken to knocking on my door at night and inviting me in for a drink. He was a character and very generous. He usually called up at about 8 o'clock. Five out of seven nights a week. That night I waited at home for Don to knock and say the bar was open, but he never knocked. Still no answer? No, no. I've been ringing long enough. I'm getting a bit wooded now. I think I ought to go up and see if it's okay. Yeah, I think that'll be the best. When Barry looked through Don's window, he saw him lying on the floor. He'd been battered to death. Andy Brown, playing of the first task is elimination. Two people. Firstly, Dave. Yes, we're looking, um, despite a lot of work that we've done, uh, extensive inquiries, we haven't traced this Dave now. We know he's got a local accent. We know that um, Don knew him and uh, had said that he'd stayed with him previously. So someone in Charleston should know who he is. We haven't traced him yet. We need to trace him and eliminate him. And the chap in the black uh, tracksuit in the clothes? We're obviously interested in him because at 10 to 7, 20 to 7, that's the relevant time as far as we're concerned. Um, it's a dead end, so he was obviously going somewhere and he didn't visit anyone in that close. It may well be that he visited Don. OK, that's Thursday the 24th of August. Now, these things are missing, at least these are replicas of things that are missing. Don's uh, black purse, like that, just in case you've found it, obviously. It's a great long shot, this. And his wallet, it's a fairly ordinary brown wallet, nothing very distinctive about this, is there? But what you might have found inside, and that's really just the most important thing of all, Again, it's a long shot, but di did you find these travel cards, a bus cards, a bus pass and, uh, and a train pass? Now, presumably the most important thing is anybody who knew Don, anybody who knew his visitors, anybody who, who might have come into contact with him. We know that he had a lot of visitors to his home. Um, people used to go there for a drink. Sometimes they'd go down there to sell him things. We know he's bought things, not things that he would always uh, need himself. He has loaned money. Uh, normally he would get it back, but... There's a host of reasons why someone would go there. We need anyone that's been to his house to contact us. There is a reward. Crime Stoppers have put up a reward of £5,000. We need the information. Mr Brown, thank you. If there's anything you know, anything that you can add, there's the number. It's a free call here to the studio. Or you can ring the incident room direct. That's a free phone number, 0800 318 001. 0800 318 001. Looking for some burglars. Operation Christmas Cracker was that nationwide dragnet against burglars and receivers, and it's shown how effective targeted policing can be. It's not just a minor crime they're going after, as anyone who's had a break-in knows. In this case, though, it led to the most serious consequences of all. It's another tragic case where a knife has led to someone being killed.
Foxtrot TOA, 2nd Avenue. Got a man seriously injured. Need an ambulance on the hurry up, please. That's very distinctive, you say, Scott. Yes, sir. Seems to have left behind. There appears to be some markings on the handle, sir. Right, just back it up, Scott, and uh, we'll look at it later, and we'll protect the tip. He was stabbed. I think you better see this. Where was it? Inside the house. We haven't found the knife, but we're starting a wider search now. Scott, will you deal with that? Yes, sir. John Eden was 48, a floor tiler. He'd been divorced for 17 years and lived alone in Enfield in North London, close to one of his two daughters. He used to brighten everyone's day up all the time because he was just so full of life and used to make everyone laugh all the time. He was never, ever a sad man. And no matter what crowd he was put in, he would get on with everyone. Well, it's the biggest crowd... Oh, he was just like a 23 year old really, just used to have fun all the time. He lived each day for each day. He was the best dad in the world. Not just a dad though, was he? He was my friend as well. I was just driving around to John's to pick him up to um, go out for a drink. Upstairs, John's neighbours, Tina and Andy, were staying in and, ironically, were watching last month's programme. Well, the phones have been very busy. We've had uh, a number of calls on the murder of Don Herbert, some suggestions for who Dave may be and also a suggestion for who the man wearing the red hat may be. Um, in the Norfolk robbery, one... But don't forget, we'll be back tonight with Crime Watch Update at 11.15. And if you can't stay up till then, please, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. In the nightclub, he was laughing and joking. Nothing out of the ordinary at all. Just an ordinary night out with all the boys and just having a drink and having a good time. You set the alarm? John normally stayed until the early hours, but he wanted an early night and was taken home by another friend of his soon after midnight. Lovely, John. All right, so I'll get you a bell on Saturday, yeah? Wherever you like, John, wherever all you right, like. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks yeah. for the lift, all right? Oh, no worries. God bless. Okay, take care. I heard a big bang from underneath our room. I caught a glimpse of a man wearing light-coloured clothing, like trousers and a light jacket, I think. Please, please.
as I looked down the street, I could see a car in the middle of a three-point turn. I just happened to glance down. I didn't recognise it as being John downstairs. Andy! Andy! The police had traced John's call and arrived within three minutes. John had been stabbed with a hunting knife. Mr Chaplin, how serious is the risk for householders generally of, of this sort of thing? Well, fortunately, most burglaries are committed in the daylight hours and not at night time. And fortunately, most burglars don't carry weapons like we've got in this case. So, I mean, most of the fear burglaries at night, but it's during daylight hours that the big problem is. That is when most of the burglaries are committed. And, and this weapon, I mean, this is a, a replica of one that was used to kill John Eden. This was not an implement used to break in. I mean, this is a deliberate no, this was defensive or aggressive weapon. Yes, that's right. It was carried by the person, I think, to actually effect his um, escape. Now, you're not sure I know which colour handle it's got, but you're pretty sure it's one of these two, two knives. They're both from the same manufacturer. That's correct, yes. One has a black handle and the other has an olive-coloured handle, both made in Spain by a manufacturer uh, named Moolah. And one's got ALCE on it, LC, the other's got uh, Muller on it. And, of course, you recovered the sheath that this, uh, this came in. Here are the, the, the tools that he did use to get into the house, or they used. Not a lot of help, this bolster. It's not very distinctive, but this screwdriver really is. Tell us about this in the paintwork here. Yes, it's uh, an R&S uh, nine-inch screwdriver with a red handle, but in the handle is burnt in by a soldering iron, we believe, the name Paul. <coughs> Paul. Yeah. Now... Uh, what do you know about the man? Um, we don't know anything about this screwdriver apart from the fact that it's got uh, white paint on it. But what we're looking to do is connect the items all together with a team of professional burglars that are operating in North London. You think these are sort of jobbing burglars? This wasn't a one-off? No, we think they are actually a team of uh, burglars that are actually operating together. OK, the car that they might have made off in or could have been entirely innocent, of course, the one doing a three-point turn. That's right. It could have been parked there by somebody unconnected. It's a large uh, silver-coloured or light-coloured car, modelled in shape with rounded uh, corners. OK. This was uh, a very, very uh, vicious crime, apart from the fact there was obviously one uh, resulting in death, because uh, there were five, six, seven or eight, I think, stab wounds altogether. If you can help, please call the studio now. This is the free call number 0500 600 600. If you prefer, you can ring detectives at the incident room in Edmonton. They're on 0181 345 4361. That's 0181 345 4361.